There was a recent study that was done that was conducted by neurologists, and they observed the brains of people as they remembered and experienced the time that they felt close to God while either in prayer or worship or maybe in solitude. Then these neurologists exposed those people to images of stained glass, the smell of incense, icons, and other religious images with the purpose of connecting them to God. And the study showed that a specific area of the brain called, called the caudate nucleus lit up in these folks when they felt connected to God. So you get what I'm saying? There's a part of the brain they can see. It's kind of like, literally, it's, it's blinking, you know, as they are running this test. Now, just for the sake of clarity, um, James Bryant Smith writes that the caudate nucleus is not a God spot, okay? It's, it's a part of the brain that's activated when we feel connected to the divine. The neurologist tested another group, but this time, they exposed them to material possessions. When they showed them images that were tied to like the cool brands, the exact same area of the brain lit up. The neurologist discovered that people who bought certain items experienced the same sensation as those who had had deep religious experiences. So, the bottom line of this experiment is that there was no discernible difference between the way the subject's brains reacted to these powerful and cool brands and the way they reacted to religious icons and figures. So, here in this section of the Sermon of the Mount that we're going to talk about, 2,000 years ago, Jesus calls out what those who would follow him might struggle to realize. We have a definition. All of us do. We do. We have a definition of heaven on earth. This idea of accumulating more stuff, of having more possessions. And then on top of it, being filled with anxiety about all of that and about life in general. And Jesus is telling us that's not the way of the upside down kingdom. Here's what I want you to take home today. Jesus is stunningly clear. Living as an upside down kingdom citizen means mammon or, or money. Mammon or money. It's the same, same word. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Mammon as a substitute for God is unacceptable. And learning to live within limits of our daily lives is an authentic reflection of the kingdom of God in each and every one of us. See, part of the struggle with the human condition is the idea that we have somehow, that we think we have the ability to create perfect living conditions, or, or what I would call heaven on earth. But in this passage, there are at least two warnings that I want to draw our attention to uh, this morning. Here's the first warning for upside down citizens, upside down kingdom citizens. More money, more problems. More money equals more problems. Look at verses 19 through 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other, you cannot serve both God and money. It's clear. Jesus knew that each of us have, did you know that? Everybody in here, every last one of you, you have treasure. We all have treasure. 
And then the problem, typically speaking, is whatever our earthly treasure is, it will never be enough. Never. And it doesn't matter what we observe with regard to this issue, particularly in Western culture. We are seemingly never, ever satisfied either. So it's never enough, and we're never, ever satisfied. You know, I actually looked this up this week, or a couple of weeks ago, and from what I could see, somewhere between seven to ten days before the iPhone 15, you know, the titanium iPhone, you know, the iPhone 15, seven to ten days before iPhone 15 was launched, do you know what there were stories about? Anybody want to guess? iPhone 16. Already iPhone 15 isn't enough. If you want to see what you truly value, think about what you're willing to protect with your very life. What do you lock up from prying eyes? What do you and I secure? How do we secure it? And ultimately, what will we die for? In plain language, what we love reveals who we are. So that's why it's more than a little bit ironic. I know that our Sunday school class has been going through the book of Ecclesiastes. Is that right? No? Oh, good. Okay, just because some of y'all weren't going to say anything. I was like, uh, guys, you've been teaching Ecclesiastes. Nobody knows it. They've been going through the book of Ecclesiastes, right? And it's written by an individual of whom it was said had immeasurable wealth, right? Solomon, immeasurable wealth. Here are the following words that he shared. Whoever loves money never has enough. This comes from the guy who's got, <laughs> arguably, he was considered the richest man in the world. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. That is mind-blowing. And here in this passage... Jesus speaks up of storing up treasures in heaven. In the practice of Jewish faith in, in his time, this treasures in heaven is actually closely associated with charitable giving to those who are in need. Another way to think about storing up treasures in heaven is to think on a verse we're going to read in a moment, to think on this verse. This verse says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. If we want to find authentic, eternal treasure, we have to seek God's kingdom first. It's ultimately about having possessions and not being possessed by what we have. It's okay to have possessions. You just can't be possessed by what you got. How many of you have ever heard this following? Have you ever heard this phrase? Money is the root of? Oh, so you have heard the phrase. Money is the root of all evil, right? I've heard that too. But here's what the apostle actually said, and some of you have already caught it. Here, here's what he actually said. For the, the love of money. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, this is a critical distinction to make and to recognize. Not money itself. That's not the problem. It's the love of money that Jesus says is the issue. You know, we also find Jesus talking about the eye. He talks about the eye in a way that his hearers would immediately know that he was addressing the difference between health and wholeness. Uh, back at that time, how your eyes looked was an indication of how healthy you were. The idea of being single-minded in devotion to God when it came to the issue of possessions, money, treasures of earth. And Jesus speaks not of, of, of not being able to serve God in money, and the word that's translated from the language that Jesus spoke, Jesus spoke Aramaic, all right? And in Aramaic, the word mammon, we, we mentioned that a few minutes ago, mammon, 
This unusually strong way of speaking about the power of money is very intentional on the part of Jesus. Hey, think back to that opening story that I told you about the test on the brain. Essentially, Jesus is calling our possessions, our stuff, our money, it's a rival to God. That's what he says. It's a rival to God. In his book, Money and Possessions in the Bible, Walter Brueggemann quotes Jacques Ellul, who writes this. We absolutely must not minimize the parallel that Jesus draws between God and mammon. He's not using a rhetorical figure. He's pointing out a reality. God is a person and mammon as a person find themselves in conflict. Jesus describes the relation between us and one or the other in the same way. It's a, ma- it's a relationship between servant and master. Mammon can be a master the same way God is. That is, mammon can be a personal master. In other words, money can control you. Did you know that? Jesus is saying money can control you. But I also think it's very important to say at this point, Jesus isn't telling us not to value things. That's not what he's saying. But rather, what he's telling us is what kinds of things we are to treasure. Let me repeat that. Jesus isn't telling us not to value things, but rather what he's telling us is what kinds of things we are to treasure. Here's a problem, friends. New Testament scholar Craig Bloomberg wrote this. He said, many prospective observers have sensed that the greatest danger to Western Christianity is not as it sometimes alleged prevailing ideologies like Marxism, Islam, the New Age movement, or humanism, but rather the all-pervasive materialism of our affluent culture. That is the problem. That is what gets us in trouble. More money, more problems. That's the way it has been. That's the way it's going to continue to be. It's a challenge for those of us who want to be part of this upside-down kingdom. Jesus goes on here in chapter 6 of Matthew's gospel. He's got a warning, a second warning for upside-down kingdom citizens. It's this, worry is a wrecking ball. Worry is a wrecking ball to your life. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you worry by worrying at a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon, remember the richest man, we just talked about that from, not even Solomon, Jesus says, in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For pagans, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had it happened to you where you've got a thought in your head and you just couldn't get it out of your head, no matter what you did, everything you did reminds you of that. You're like trying to forget it and it just won't leave, right? I'm going to share one. I had a thought like that and it struck me as I was preparing this message. No matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't shake that thought. I'll get to that in a second. But there's another reality behind this statement that Jesus makes here in the Sermon on the Mount when it comes to worries. And this is what it is. We refuse to live in, within limits. We don't know how to say, this is where I end, and whatever that is, begins. We refuse to live within limits. 
I want to talk a little bit deeper about what Jesus is talking about here. So let's be clear. Jesus instructs us, he says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Jesus isn't calling us to be irresponsible, okay? Jesus doesn't say, oh, don't put clothes on, going outside is fine. That's not what he's saying. You could make the case based on the illustration that Jesus gives here, centering on birds. It's probably just the opposite. Birds are probably some of the busiest creatures on the planet, right? I mean, have you ever noticed birds? All right? Honestly, it has made me frustrated more than once or twice just how quickly those birds can build a nest in my porch light. I take it down one day, the next day, you know what's back up in the porch light? Another bird's nest. They are fast. They're efficient. They're focused. They just don't worry about feeding themselves or their offspring. Do you know what they do? They just get it done, man. They just get it done. No, what Jesus is calling you and I to is to trust in God's plan, to trust in God's reign, and to trust in God's care. The noun, the verb that's used here that indicates anxiety or worry is actually closely associated with sleeplessness. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's, that's what Jesus is talking about that kind of worry. Anna Case Winters writes that Jesus, what he is prohibiting here is the energy draining, chronic, paralyzing anxiety that is futile and even self-destructive. But you may still find yourself saying, okay, okay, is Jesus saying we should live in poverty? I mean, he did seem to be saying that over in another story that we read in Luke chapter 18. I mean, you guys remember this story, right? From Luke 18, verse, beginning in verse 18, a certain ruler, certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. And you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother, your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad. The he is a young man who was talking to Jesus. He became very sad because he was very wealthy. No, folks, Jesus had that conversation with, <laughs> with one person, this whole idea of giving away everything. He had that conversation with one person. It was one encounter in the gospel. Try to guess how many other times Jesus had this conversation with anyone else. Zero. He had that conversation with anybody else. Just that guy. I, I think a better question is what is Jesus calling you and I to on the inside? Not, not worried about our stuff so much. What's he calling us to in here? Richard Foster. Richard Foster says this is a call to simplicity. It's about an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. An inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. Whatever's going on in here with Jesus is how it comes out of us. A right perspective that understands that whatever wealth we have is an unquestionable provision from God. And it's super easy. It's super easy to get confused about what this passage is calling us to this reality of worry being a wrecking ball for the kingdom citizen. It's also tempered by an observation that one of my favorite writers, Philip Yancey, makes in a book called The Jesus I Never Knew. He says this, he says, I found that Jesus gave us these words not to cumber us, not to hinder us, but to tell us what God is like. The character of God is the earned text of the Sermon on the Mount. Why should we love our enemies? Because our clement father causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. Why be perfect? Because God is perfect. Why store up treasures in heaven? Because the father lives there 
and will lavishly reward us. Why live without fear and worry? Because the same God who clothes the lilies and the grass of the field has promised, he's promised to take care of us. According to the New York Times, Americans are among the most anxious people on the planet. One study found that Americans were more significantly anxious than residents of nations like Nigeria, Lebanon, and Ukraine. We spend billions of dollars every year on anti-anxiety medications and additional millions to fund research into the causes and the cures for anxiety disorders. Time Magazine, not too long ago, had a cover story that dealt with teenage anxiety. And this was the headline. The kids are not all right. American teens are anxious, depressed, and overwhelmed. And the article claimed that today's adolescents are the post-9-11 generation. They're raised in an era of economic and national insecurity. They've never known a time when terrorism and school shootings weren't the norm. They grew up watching their parents weather a severe recession. And perhaps most importantly, they were a hit puberty at a time when technology and social media were transforming society. One expert said this. He said, if you want to create an environment to churn out angsty people, we've done it. One teenager explained this. We're the first generation that cannot escape our problems at all. We're like little volcanoes. We're getting this constant pressure from our phones, from our relationships, from the way things are today. Here's one last thing. Remember I told you I had this thought that I just couldn't get out of my brain? When it comes to this challenge that Jesus is calling us to live out, when it comes to worry, think about this. I found myself wondering if it comes down to believing the lie, the lie, that if I worry enough, then I could somehow control things. Does that make sense? Like if I think about it enough, I could actually affect the outcome. Look at me. I worried so much. I changed my destiny. That is the very same thing Adam and Eve wanted in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Control. They wanted control of things. I wonder if I've fallen for a similar lie that God's actually holding out on me and if I just work myself up enough, I'll somehow get exactly what I want. It's a lie. The truth is the truth about getting our hands around the issue of worrying is to remember we only go so far. That's it. We have limits. And Jesus knew that. We're being invited into something. That's the truth. We're being invited into something much grander than we could even imagine or think. But it's going to cost us something. I remembered the following account, and it came to mind when I was preparing this, this message, what it means in our context to focus on treasures in heaven and to leave worries behind. Sir Nicholas Winton. Anybody ever heard that name? Nicholas Winton. Some of you may have heard. He famously is dubbed the British Schindler, as in Schindler's list, right? He died at the age of 106. But back in the 1930s, he was a young stockbroker in London. But on the cusp of World War II, Winton canceled a ski trip that he was going to take to Czechoslovakia. Why? Why did he do that? Because there were Jewish children that needed to be saved. And saved them from concentration camps, he did. He helped 669 Jewish children escape before the border was closed down by Germany. And many 
Many of these children have grown up and (laughs) they're known as Winston's children. But even more surprisingly, the world probably would never have known Winston's real identity if his wife had not bumped into a box of notes that was in their attic. Winton suggested discarding the papers. His wife replied, you can't throw these papers away. They are children's lives. And although he never really gave a reason for doing it, Winton has said some people revel in taking risk. And some go through life taking no risks at all. I like to think that whether Winston knew it or not, he was fulfilling the call here, that he was storing up treasure in heaven and not on earth. That is what we're being invited to do in order to become citizens of the upside down kingdom. Would you pray with me? Father, The conditions for heaven on earth, Lord, they don't line up with what we often think is a reflection of your kingdom here on earth. Lord, we are grateful that Jesus lays it out very clearly for us, what does prepare us to experience your kingdom and to have your kingdom come. Father, It is not about money. It's not about possessions. God, there's no amount of worrying and fretting about our condition that's going to miraculously change things. No. You call us to simple dependence on you. That's hard because, God, everyone in here has a story of a time when we just weren't sure of what was going to happen. But then God came through. Help us to remember that. And God, for those that we love and those that we care about, perhaps our story can help them as well to look to you, to trust in you, and to lean on you. God, help us to be kingdom people every chance we get so that folks will know that you are real, that you love them. We thank you. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.